Okay, we start with uh, Beat. Dr. Helling, you have spoken about the twelve um, about the twelve minutes, and you said in the context in the context you said uh, that is uh, basic for a one time shot. How is the relation or the context? Uh, you mean the reason for the one one dose cure? Um, yes. Yes. So, so currently the, the treatment is is three days with uh, four pills in the morning, four in the afternoon, and you can see normally in, when you start to treat a child, for instance, that after the second day the fever goes away. And at that point, many mothers keep the rest and don't do the whole treatment. So the idea is if you have a one-dose cure, there's no choice. You give the whole dose in once. Did I understand your question? <laughs> Sorry. You showed, you showed the slide where it begins with 498 and it ends up at 12. Oh. Yes. So the, this and in this context, you said, and this is the point. Yeah. And I asked you, what is the context Sorry. or the, the exact relation between that? So the faster you can clear the, the parasites from the organism, the shorter is the treatment you may need. So you, you saw that it was like uh, 12 hours. Hours. So hopefully if you can give a dose that is high enough without side effects into a patient or a child, one dose might be enough. But we don't know that yet. So we are experimenting currently with this and with the combinations. My question is for Eder, right. It's about Chagas, and uh, it's because uh, I don't know, I know very little or almost nothing about this disease. But I believe that um, uh, in many uh, Latin American countries, is the chronic stages, and that in some cases they are, uh, so the, it's not so much the parasite, but it's the inflammatory response that many people consider that is even a kind of autoimmune or autoimmune-like. And I believe that some people even try to treat with TGF-beta uh, inhibitors, which for me is kind of counterintuitive because we have like the effector uh, pathogenic T cells that they can cause the inflammation and the regulatory that they are depending very much on T. So complex question, do you see uh, a possibility to intervene with the, 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 the effector, the T cells, not only with the parasite, and what is the role of these effectors and maybe the regulatory cells in the disease? Yes, what you are pointing out is uh, an old discussion uh, if uh, Chagas disease in the chronic uh, form was uh, causing a damage, a damage because of the presence of the parasite or if it was an immune reaction that destroyed the cardiac tissue. In fact, uh, I had uh, several slides that I wanted to show, but in order to make it uh, short, I didn't, I didn't do it, but if you take a look to that slide, it was full of parasites, and it was a cardiac tissue. So there are new techniques that now allow to find out much more easily and identify the presence of the parasites within uh, the muscles. So the parasites are really a target to be attacked, and uh, whether it, if it will be possible to tune the immune system to fight against the presence of the parasite, uh, that's not a simple question I can answer right now, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss the opportunity of uh, combine a treatment with immunomodulators and uh, a parasitic drug as well. But uh, there's no doubt, no doubt right now that the parasite, it is without the cells. 
wedding. <laughs> Thank you. Are there other questions? I have one question to Professor Herling. Is this new substance also active against Vivox? Yes, but only the blood stages. No No, it did not affect, unfortunately, the, the, the dormant liver stages. Yes. We're still searching. Okay. To Eva. Hi. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know the way we done before with uh, archaea lipid. Quite a lot of work was done in the past. Yes. Different lipids. And, and one of the interesting things really is the high stability of the liposomes. And the claim, actually, they, they are even patent on it, claim that they can survive going through by oral delivery. Yes, I know. There is a, a German guy and other guys actually show very interesting effect of it. Uh, using against uh, biofilm and different yes. things. Yes. Okay, so you showed that you use for the loading a pH gradient. Yes. Uh, and, and did you look for the release? What happened to, because... Yes, we were, this is, these are very new results. Okay. So we have followed the pH and the release of the drugs uh, during one month, and we found uh, uh, quantitative differences between what happens with the drug uh, within any type of liposomes, no matter the state of the or the composition of the lipid bilayer as compared to this, what we call allosomes. We call them allosomes because they are made of archaeolipids coming from allophilic archaea to establish a distinction and because the mixture of lipids are different from the other ones that were used up to the moment. We'll see what happens with the patent. Do you measure? No, I, I don't care <laughs> about the patent, but also yeah. I'm not involved, so I definitely not care. But I wonder what's happened. Uh, did you measure the pH gradient? In fact, we have measured uh, the, uh, the, that the pH within the uh, liposomes and within the archosomes remains, in the last case, it remains stable by using a fluorescent dye, mm -hmm. FATC. Okay. And in the case of liposome, it fades very rapidly. And uh, also, the amount of, for instance, imiquimod that is loaded within the nanoallosomes, it, it is much more higher than in uh, liposomes from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And do you know the state of the drug inside the liposome? No, we, we didn't check it. Mm -hmm. We just made so few points. But it is within the, the structure, that's no doubt about it. Okay, thank you. Oh, yes. Yeah, my, my question is for Professor Helling. You know, I can, I can I understand the, the amount of you know, work and the amount of effort you know, directed at you know, um, bringing out new medicines for malaria, you know, new medications for malaria. Yeah, it's, really, it's amazing, the amount of effort. So I, I would like to find out if Novartis is also, also channeling their, you know, directing their effort, you know, at, you know, uh, coming up with, with a vaccine for malaria, vaccine for malaria, you know, has enough effort been channeled in this direction and, and what are the prospects? Uh, as the resources for neglected diseases are limited, of course, uh, as, as we all know, we have tried to talk with other people working in the field and, and not be redundant. And so, as you know, GSK has been investing a huge amount of resources in developing the RST, uh, RST vaccine. And we have focused on, on small molecule treatments. So different people are taking other approaches, and in the end, it would be great to combine them all. So we, Novartis, have not done the vaccine approach for malaria. 
Okay, then, then for, if I'm still permitted, for Professor Fernandez, I think he also mentioned in passing, he mentioned, briefly mentioned that, you know, there are prospects in, from his work for a malaria vaccine, so, you know, and um, I, I would want him to, to shed more light on, on that aspect of his work also. Yeah, we just found out um, serendipitously, as, as, as I have mentioned, that uh, not only a polyamidomines, but uh, several other types of polymers, like uh, heparin. Actually, here in Basel, there is a group uh, who have also shown that uh, uh, nanoparticles uh, covered with heparin that um, bind the malaria parasite. Uh, they also seem to have um, um, a potential activity um, uh, as a vaccine adjuvants. And I think probably the role of, of all those uh, polymers, until now all the structures that have this uh, activity are polymers, are um, binding to the parasite somehow, and in that way they prevent uh, reinfection of new red blood cells. But the consequence of this is that uh, plasmodium is um, in the blood circulation for a longer time. And then this simply might give more time to the immune system to see the parasite and build um, an immune reaction. Then probably that, that would be seen uh, likely with uh, every antimalarial whose mode of action is uh, invasion inhibition, of, of which there are several uh, that we know of. And then it will not be a particularity of, of polyamidomines. But uh, we feel that, that it's interesting to incorporate this new uh, strategy. Until now, we have uh, always talked of combination therapies as combining uh, two different drugs that uh, act in different ways or uh, have different modes of action. But I think uh, given... Uh, the appearance of resistances um, and likely also in, in uh, uses of combination therapies that maybe we could start thinking of com combining two different activities, maybe a drug uh, and a second activity uh, related to, to immune system potentiation. And, and this, I think, is something that uh, for the future years we might consider as new antimalarial strategy. So I think that was the last question. <laughs> so I would like to thank you very, very much for coming. I, a special thank goes to our speakers and also to those of you who took uh, active part in, in the discussions. Sorry for the short delay, and I close this session. Thank you.